Hello, and welcome to lecture 20 of Electrical Circuits 1. Today I want to wrap up first order circuit step responses. So far, we've only talked about first order circuit step responses in the absence of initial conditions. The final topic that I want to talk about here is non-zero initial conditions. In order to create non-zero initial conditions, in general, we will look at a circuit that has multiple sources or a source which changes with time between a non-zero value and some other non-zero value. Following that, we can take another look at steady state step response and DC gain. We have some points there that we want to make relative to the non-zero initial conditions. And this will follow with a discussion of bias points and nominal operating conditions. OK, there's some interpretation stuff that we will do here, which we can finally illustrate by looking at non-zero initial conditions. Following that, we'll start our discussion of second order systems. So toward the end of the lecture today, we'll start looking at circuits which contain two energy storage elements, more specifically two independent energy storage elements which can't be combined to a single element. The related educational modules are 2.5.1. Just really quickly to put our topics for today in context of what we've been talking about before, this is a block diagram of the system we've been considering. Our system is here. It has an output Y of T. It's some voltage, some current, some other parameter that's of importance to our circuit or our system. We're applying a step input to this. Our step has an amplitude of A, so our input is A times U0 of T. Now we've mentioned that in general, we will have an initial condition, a value of Y at T equals 0, that has some value Y sub 0. Now so far, we've only considered circuits which have zero initial conditions, Y of 0 is equal to 0, or equivalently, the terminology is that they are initially relaxed. OK, initially relaxed means that none of the energy storage elements initially have any energy stored in them. Now we want to consider at least one quick example of a circuit that has a non-zero initial condition. OK, the approach is not different for these. Everything that we've been doing is appropriate for this. But there are a couple of concepts and some terminology that becomes clear when we talk about this type of stuff. To illustrate the process of determining the response of a circuit with an initial condition, let's take a look at this example circuit. We have a single capacitor, one energy storage element. We have a first order system. We have a couple of resistors here, which will help dissipate energy. But now, rather than a single source, we have two sources. Okay? And the way we're going to drive this first order circuit to the right of this switch is that at time t equals 0, we move this switch from position A to position B. So when time t is less than 0, this 2 volt source is connected up to this first order circuit. After time t equals 0, we now have 5 volts applied to this first order circuit. So if we take a look at the input as a function of time, OK. For time less than 0, we have 2 volts applied to our first order circuit. At time t equals 0, we suddenly apply 5 volts to this circuit. Okay. Our goal is going to be to determine voltage as a function of time, V of t here, which is essentially the voltage across the capacitor, for time greater than 0. So we want V of t after we've moved this switch to position B. OK, the first thing I'm going to do with this circuit is determine the initial condition. What is the initial voltage across that capacitor when I start moving that switch to position B? So I need to find V of t when t is 0 just after I've moved that switch. Now, if this switch has been in position A for a long time, the circuit just looks like this circuit. I have 2 volts applied to this circuit, this 2 volt source has been applied for a long time. So everything in this circuit has had a chance to become constant. All the voltages are constant. All the currents are constant. Once that is true, I can replace my capacitor with an open circuit. 
So if I open circuit my capacitor, I can find voltage as a function of time for time just before t equals zero. This now just looks like a voltage divider. So V of t just before I move that switch, so V at t equals zero minus, is equal to the total voltage, two volts, times this resistance over the sum of these resistances. So six kilo ohms over six kilo ohms plus three kilo ohms. Six and three is nine, so this becomes two thirds. So V at t equals zero minus is two times two thirds, which is four thirds of a volt. Now we're looking at the voltage across this capacitor. So once we move this switch to position B, I cannot change this voltage instantaneously. That means the voltage across the capacitor just after I move that switch to position B remains the same. So V at T equals zero plus is also four thirds of a volt. We have our initial condition on the capacitor voltage. Now we can go ahead and determine the differential equation governing the circuit after we move the switch to position B. Now let's determine the differential equation governing this circuit. We want to find the differential equation for time greater than zero, so the switch has moved to position B. So we are actually seeing a five volt source we no longer pay any attention to that two volt source. It was only used to give us our initial condition. Okay, let's take a look at how to analyze this circuit. I think what I will do is KCL here. Okay, now I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is label the currents through these elements. If V of t is the voltage across this capacitor. The current through here is C dV by dt. Notice that I'm sticking with my passive sign convention. Positive current enters the positive voltage node. This current here is just V over 6 kilo ohms, and these two currents have to be equal to this current. So KCL tells me that the voltage difference across this resistor divided by the resistance value is the current into this node. So that's 5 volts minus this V of T. So 5 minus V over this resistance, 3 kilo ohms, is equal to the sum of this current plus this current. This current is C dV dT. The capacitance is 1 microfarad, so this is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 times dV by dt, plus this current, which is V over 6 kilo ohms. Okay, let's clear the denominator. Well, actually, let's clear this first. We'll multiply through by 1 times 10 to the 6th. That will give me 5,000 over 3 minus 1,000 over 3V is equal to dV by dt plus 1,000V over 6. Collecting terms, I have 5,000 over 3 is equal to 1,000 over 3 is 2,000 over 6, which is 3,000 over 6. V plus dV by dt. So we can simplify this slightly as 5,000 over 3 is equal to 1,000 over 2V plus dV by dt. This is our governing differential equation for the circuit. This guy here is 1 over my time constant tau. So tau is equal to 2 over 1,000, which is 2 milliseconds. I want to calculate that because I want to check that against the circuit's behavior to make sure that my differential equation is hopefully correct. Okay, we've developed a differential equation that we think is correct as far as governing the circuit's response for t greater than zero. We would, however, like to do as many checks on this differential equation as we can before we solve it. So far, for first-order circuits, we can check 
tau, the time constant, and the steady state response against the expected behavior based on examination of the circuit itself. So let's first check the time constant. Remember that for an RC circuit, tau is equal to REQ times the capacitance where REQ is the equivalent resistance seen by the capacitor. Our original circuit had a 5 volt source here. There was a 3 kilo ohm resistor. The capacitor was then in parallel with a 6 kilo ohm resistor. To determine the equivalent resistance seen by the capacitor, we remove the capacitor. These are the terminals that we're going to look into to find resistance, and we kill any sources. A voltage source will become a short circuit. When we do that, the equivalent resistance seen across these terminals is 3 kilo ohms in parallel with 6 kilo ohms. So from this, REQ is 3 kilo ohms times 6 kilo ohms over 3 kilo ohms plus 6 kilo ohms. 3 times 6 is 18, 3 plus 6 is 9, this is 2 kilo ohms. So REQ is 2 kilo ohms, so tau is 2 kilo ohms times the capacitance, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 farads, which is 2 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds, which is 2 milliseconds. This agrees with the 1,000 over 2, Invert that, 2 over 1,000 is 2 times 10 to the minus third. The time constant in our differential equation looks correct. Now let's take a look at checking the steady state response. If this circuit is sitting with its switch in position B for a long time, the capacitor will end up looking like an open circuit. So our circuit, as time t goes to infinity, will look like this. So V of t, as t goes to infinity, looks like a voltage divider. So the final value of voltage is going to be, we already decided that this was 2 thirds of the total voltage, so 5 times 2 over 3, or 10 over 3 volts from the circuit. We also claimed that as t goes to infinity for this particular step forcing function, everything's going to become constant. That's how we replace this capacitor with an open circuit. If everything becomes constant, this guy goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Therefore, v as t goes to infinity is equal to 5,000 over 3 times 2 over 1,000, multiplying through by 2, dividing through by 1,000, this becomes 10 over 3 volts. They check. It looks like we're in pretty good shape as far as this differential equation correctly describing the circuit. OK, now let's go ahead and solve the differential equation to determine the circuit response. Our differential equation was dv dt plus 500 V of T is equal to 5,000 over 3. We also previously determined our initial and final conditions. Our initial condition, V of 0, is 4 thirds of a volt. V as T goes to infinity is 10 thirds volts. Now, regardless of whether the initial conditions are 0 or non-zero, the form of the solution is the same for a first order circuit we will still assume that V of t is some constant k1 times e to the minus t over tau plus some other constant k2, and we will still use the initial and final conditions to determine k1 and k2. So, using the initial conditions, V at 0, if t is 0, e to the t over tau is 1, this is k1 plus k2, this is equal to 4 over 3. V as t goes to infinity, as this 
becomes negative infinity, e to the negative infinity becomes zero, we are just left with k2, that is equal to 10 over 3. Solving these two for k1, we can plug in 10 over 3 for k2, we find that k1 plus 10 over 3 is equal to 4 over 3, therefore k1 is minus 6 thirds, which is minus 2. Now we can just go ahead and plug k1 and k2 into here. We get v of t is equal to k2, which is 10 over 3, minus k1, which is 2 e to the minus tau is 1 over 500. So v of t is 10 thirds minus 2 e to the minus 500 t for time greater than 0. Now let's quickly sketch the input and output functions. We've previously sketched the input function as a function of time. So the input to the system, u of t, started out at 2 volts. And at t equals 0, it abruptly increased to 5 volts. The output, v of t, resulting from that, started out at 4 thirds of a volt. Okay, the initial condition was 4 thirds of a volt. It finally went to 10 thirds of a volt as t went to infinity, and it approached that value exponentially. So we had a time constant here, tau, of 2 milliseconds. Now this is perfectly fine, okay, and if we wire this circuit up, it will work okay according to this, okay? But what I want to do is redo this example with a slightly different conceptual outlook on things. I want to get a little bit more abstract about it, which will illustrate a couple of points that we'll be using over the rest of the course, and actually in future courses as well. Mathematically, I can represent u of t as a constant value, 2 volts plus a change in input, so 2 volts plus some delta u, which is 3 times u0 of t. So delta u of t is 3 times u0 of t. If I add 3 u0 of t onto 2, I will get this input forcing function. So this is a perfectly good mathematical representation of this signal. Let's use this mathematical representation to reanalyze the circuit and reinterpret the output in terms of a constant value and a change to that constant value. Okay, now let me look at my previous circuit with a different rendition of the source functions. Okay. I'm going to put two voltage sources in series. Voltage sources in series add directly. So I have a constant two volt source here, which never changes from t from minus infinity to infinity. To that, I am going to add a voltage source, which somehow magically starts applying three volts at t equals zero. So the input function from this source is 3 u0 of t volts. If I add these together to get my overall input u of t that's applied to my first order circuit, I get the previous forcing function that I had with the two source circuit previously. I start out with 2 volts before t equals 0. At t equals 0, I start adding another 3 volts on top of that. So I jump up to 5 volts. This is the same input function that I had before by moving a switch between two different sources. The nice thing about this is that I can use superposition. I have two sources. I can determine the response of the circuit to this source. Then I can determine the response of the circuit to this source and add the two together to get the overall response. My final result will be the same, but the process of doing this will illustrate a couple of really important points.
Okay, since I'm going to use superposition this time around, the first thing I'm going to do is determine the circuit's response, V of t, to this constant 2-volt source. Okay, remember the 2-volt part of this never changes. I start applying 2 volts to this at t equals infi negative infinity, and I never stop applying this voltage. Since this is a constant value, any voltages or currents in this circuit that are associated with this will become constant by the time t equals zero. Therefore, I can replace my capacitor with an open circuit and find V of t due to this two volt source. I just have a voltage divider, so let me call this V1 of t, okay, the voltage due to source number one is equal to six kilo ohms over six kilo ohms plus 3 kilo ohms times the total voltage is now 2 volts. This is 2 thirds of 2 volts or 4 thirds volts. Okay. Surprise, it's the same as the initial condition we got earlier, but now we're considering it to be the response to a constant voltage source, which stays in the circuit after I flip the switch. Okay, now let's determine the response of this circuit to our other source, okay? So we're now going to apply this 3U0 of T voltage step input and find the portion of the output voltage that is due to this source. There is one important conceptual difference between this approach and the approach that we used the first time around. This circuit is initially relaxed, okay? We have no voltage V2 of T here for T less than zero because we're not applying any voltage from this input before T equals zero, okay? So we've changed things slightly from looking at this as an initial condition plus some response to looking at it as two forcing functions, one of which is constant, the other of which is changing with time. Okay, so let's derive the input-output differential equation for this circuit. I'm still going to do basically what I did before, which is KCL at this node. This current here is still C dV dt. So if I take the current into this node, set that equal to the currents going through the capacitor and through this resistor, I can determine the governing differential equation for the circuit. Current into this node is 3 volts minus V2 over 3 kilo ohms. Okay. Current going through the capacitor is equal to C, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 times dV dt, plus this current, and that gets a V2, this current, which is V2 over 6 kilo ohms. Okay. Now we're going to do a little bit of algebra, multiply through by 1 times 10 to the 6, that becomes 3,000 over 3 minus 1,000 V2 over 3 is equal to dV2 by dt plus 1,000 V2 over 6. Grouping my V2 terms, I get 1,000 is equal to this is 2,000 over 6 plus 1,000 over 6 is 3,000 over 6 times V2 plus dV2 by dt. There is my governing differential equation. Notice one thing here. This guy here has changed because my source term has changed from the first time that I did this example. However, Tau is still 6 over 3,000, which is 2 times 10 to the minus third. The time constant is the same time constant that we got the first time we did this problem. That's because nothing to the right of this source has changed. We've only changed the forcing terms. The time constant is a function of the RC circuit that we're connected to. 
Okay, so this is good news. I don't feel the need to go back and recheck my time constant, and I'm actually going to get checking my final condition too, and just barge ahead and solve the differential equation. Okay, now let's calculate the response of the system to this three volt step input. Okay, so this is the response to the step input. Once we finally get done with this, we'll add our previous response from the constant two volt value to get the overall response. We came up with the governing differential equation, which simplified down to dv2 dt plus 500 v2 of t is equal to 1,000. The form of the solution for this is v2 of t is k1 times e to the minus 500 t plus k2. This number comes down here with a negative sign in front of it. That's the same thing we've been doing for the last couple of lectures. We also claimed that for this particular forcing function, since it's a step input, it is zero before t is equal to zero. Therefore, this circuit, or this circuit in response to just the step input, is initially relaxed, and v2 of zero is equal to zero. Now, we still need a final condition in order to evaluate k1 and k2. For our final condition, our circuit looks like a three volt source, okay, with a capacitor which opens circuits because everything's eventually going to become constant here. This final value of this voltage can be determined just from a voltage divider. So V2 of T, as T goes to infinity, is equal to two thirds of three, which is just two volts. Okay, so V2 as T goes to infinity, this term goes away, this is just equal to K2. V2 of zero is K1 plus K2, therefore my final V2 of T is equal to two times one minus E to the minus 500 T for T greater than zero. Okay, so now we've got the responses of the circuit to the two volt constant source and to the three volt step source. We can superimpose those to get the overall system response. So V1 of T, the response to the two volt constant source was four thirds of a volt. V2 of T was two times one minus E to the minus 500 T. So the overall voltage V of T is V1 of T plus V2 of T, which is equal to 4 thirds plus 2 minus 2 E to the minus 500 T. 2 is 6 thirds, so this is equal to 10 over 3 minus 2 E to the minus 500 T volts for T greater than 0. So there is our final expression for the voltage across that capacitor. It agrees with the previous result that we got. There is nothing wrong with this superposition approach. But it does provide us with a different way to look at problems like this. I'll elaborate on that in the next couple of slides. Okay, I'd like to make a few comments relative to this conceptual approach of decomposing the input into two different functions and then using a superposition type of approach to determine the response. Okay, So both the input and the output for our previous example can be decomposed into a constant value and a time varying value. So we can revise our previous block diagram and we don't need to worry about initial conditions to a general input being some constant value, which I'm denoting as a capital U, plus some time varying value, which is a delta U of t, a change, which can change as a function of time. The output here is now some constant value, capital Y. The capital Y will be directly due to the capital U. It has some time varying component as well, delta Y of t, the delta y of t is directly due to the delta u of t, since we're decomposing the input and then re-superimposing them to get the output. This turns out to be amazingly convenient sometimes. Okay. For example, we talked about DC gain previously. The DC gain becomes extremely useful at times 
since you can apply that individually to the constant values and the time varying values. Okay, let me kind of illustrate what I'm talking about here graphically on the next slide. Okay, graphically what we're doing here, okay, for our step function case, our u of t was some constant value u plus some change in that delta u. So we had this delta u of t that if we added to this constant value made this result look like an elevated step function. This resulted in an output response which had some constant value y that was due to this capital U plus some delta y of t which was due to the delta u of t. When we add those up we get this elevated kind of step response. Okay? Now it turns out that if we take a look at the DC gain our input has some final value delta u of infinity if we just look at the time varying part. Likewise, the delta y of t has some final value. Okay? The DC gain can apply directly to the change in these perturbations. We don't have to worry about this offset. So the system's DC gain can be determined as the change in the output as t goes to infinity divided by the change in the input as t goes to infinity. We don't need to actually worry about this offset level. Okay, I'll explain why that can be useful in the next slide. Okay, so why would we go through these mental gymnastics to decompose this into two different parts? Okay, it turns out that decomposing these into a constant and a time varying component can simplify both our analysis and our interpretation of results. For example, when we're interpreting the results of data that we acquire in the lab, this can be amazingly useful. In fact, it's so useful that this constant part has its own name. The constant part of the input and output is often called the bias point or if you're a controls type engineer or a systems person, it will be referred to as the nominal operating point. Okay. The dynamic response of the system, okay, if you're only interested in the dynamics of the system, you don't really care too much about this. You use the time varying part of the input output relationship to characterize the dynamics. Remember when we found the constant part, we open circuited the capacitors. There was not a dynamic circuit connected to our source. Okay? One case in which this becomes extremely useful, this frame of mind, if you remember back in lecture one, I talked about different types of systems. Lump parameter models resulted in ordinary differential equations. Distributed parameter models resulted in partial differential equations. Linear systems resulted in linear differential equations. Nonlinear systems resulted in nonlinear differential equations. I also claimed two other things. One, that virtually every system in the world is ultimately nonlinear. Two, we don't like that. We don't like that because nonlinear systems are very difficult to design. The way we get around that and why we want to spend classes and classes and classes talking about linear systems is that if you have a nonlinear system, quite often you approximate that as a linear system around some bias point. I won't get into the details of this, and this is actually more of a junior level class topic, but this is ultimately why this is useful. I want to at least mention it in passing so that you're receptive to the idea when it comes up later, and we'll probably do a little data analysis later in the class to kind of illustrate this a bit. Okay, but this is why I wanted to talk about the superposition approach and emphasize these points.